Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about how historical events shaped our ancestors' lives. Hopefully you had the opportunity to watch Who Do You Think You Are last night, if you are here in the United States. Jesse Tyler Ferguson uh, went on a journey to discover more about his great-grandfather, I won't give away any show spoilers in today's uh, as we talk today, but uh, there were a couple of things about his uh, experience that really stood out to me. One is that in order to understand his great grandfather better and to understand the choices that he made, he needed to understand a little bit of historical context. He needed to know a little bit about what was going on in different areas of the country at different times, both um, some historical events, as well as, and, and I really loved this, the financial climate of the country at the time. So it got me thinking about how historical events shaped our ancestors' lives and ways we can figure out um, that information. So first, let's just start with a quick look at um, why we might want to study historical context um, or why we might want to gather that information. As I mentioned in Who Do You Think You Are last night, uh, it helped Jesse Tyler Ferguson understand his ancestor better and the choices that he made uh, in his life when he understood more about the financial climate of the country, when he understood more about some of the opportunities that were available because of different events that were occurring in the country at the time. For us, it might also help us just create a true family history, not just a genealogy of names, dates, and places. Sometimes some of us get so intent on filling in the blank spaces in our family tree that we forget that these were real people who lived real lives and, uh, you know, we're, we're sometimes so interested in, in seeing how far back we can go, which is a fun endeavor, or seeing, you know, how far down we can come, also a far endeavor, a, a fun endeavor, but um, sometimes just picking a person or a family and doing a really deep dive into their life can really help help them come to life, can really help you understand them better and and have this family history about them and their lives. It also, and this this is beneficial, can help us gain clues about where to find additional records that will help us continue to grow our family tree. Uh, as they make choices, as they as those choices affect them, as the, as they are called upon to migrate because of the various events that are occurring in their lives, it might help you know where to go to find additional records for them. <coughs> now, let's just talk about some of the questions that you can ask, because if you've spent any time with me, you know I'm a big fan of questions. Questions are kind of the root of family history research. They're what propel us forward. And if we go into it without any questions, um, sometimes we're, we flounder a little bit. So here are some of the specific questions that you can ask that will lead you to finding the information you need. The first one is, what was going on in the world or in the country during the lifetime of the particular ancestor that you're studying. Now, world events and countrywide events sometimes just give us a frame of reference or a context for what's happening with them. Not always do those world events or country of events affect individual lives. Now, of course, there are major exceptions, things like this, the U.S. Civil War. That was a countrywide event, but it affected almost every single person in the country, whether they were called upon to fight or called upon to contribute to the war effort or called upon to send sons off to war and maintain the home front or whatever the circumstances might be. There are some countrywide events that do affect every person and in individual lives that affect choices about, um, you know, political beliefs that affect choices about um, where they choose to live, that affect choices about whether or not they choose to migrate. Um, there are events that occur that cause things to happen in people's lives that then affect later choices. So again, understanding world and countrywide events that occur during the lifetime of a person is going to give you a frame of reference for, uh, for their life. 
probably more important is to understand what was happening locally for these people, what was happening in their state or their county even. Uh, that becomes a little trickier. It's a little bit more difficult sometimes to ferret out that information. But that's the kind of thing, those are the kind of events that are going to affect people more personally. We'll look at a couple of examples here in just a minute. Other questions you can ask are, what religion did they identify with? Uh, you know, were they a person of faith? Uh, did they have um, a regular religious practice? And what can you learn about the historical context of that religion? What did that, what does it mean if they were Quaker? What does it mean if they were Baptist? What does it mean if they were um, LDS? What does it mean for them and for their, the daily life that they led and the choices that they may have made? <clears throat> And so, again, that's a historical context that you can learn more about in order to understand more about them. Another um, historical thing you can learn about is education. Now, the U.S. federal census provides us with information um, really early on about whether or not people are attending school. It's always interesting to me. I always make a note of that. Um, are the children in this household uh, attending school? And I usually pay attention to when they stop attending school. Uh, you know, were the girls allowed to be educated? Were uh, the boys educated past the second or third grade? Or did they immediately get pulled out of school and put to work? Are the adults in the family literate? That's another thing that the census records. One of those tick marks on the census is, can this person read and write? So I always pay attention to that, those education type questions. And then look at the other people. Okay, we're again, in context, look at the other people on that census page. What about the rest of the community? Is your ancestor uh, educated and most of the community is not? or vice versa. That gives you some information about them and their circumstances. Um, so pay attention to that kind of information to, again, gain historical context. A uh, couple of other questions you can ask. Looking at migration or immigration, um, I've been at the Jewish Genealogical Conference this entire week and working mostly with people who are looking for family members who immigrated into the United States in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And so these people clearly immigrated, but then the question is, why did they immigrate? Um, most often in this in this particular circumstance, they're immigrating because um, their young men are being conscripted into the Tsar's army. The Jewish young men were rounded up um, and conscripted into the Tsar's army to fight. Um, sometimes it was because um, of pogroms, meaning entire villages were being wiped out um, by the army um, and the Jews were being persecuted. And their businesses were being stolen. They were being overtaxed. People were being killed. Um, and so, you know, that was a motivation to migrate. And some of them migrated out of Russia or Poland, um, into England for a while before they came to the United States or into Canada and then into the United States. Uh, and so looking at some of those circumstances, maybe understanding more about the pogroms in Russia or understanding more about what wars were occurring at the time in that place helps you understand why they may have chosen to move. A simpler example in my own family, um, I have family who was living in Kentucky in the early 1800s, and within just about a year and a half, about 18 months, almost everyone in this tiny community where my family lived picked up and moved west. Could not figure out like what the motivation was for that move, especially in such a short period of time. I've seen other patterns of migration in my family, you know, where a family migrates from Tennessee to Arkansas and various members of the extended family migrate over a period of, you know, 10 or 15 years. But this was an entire community almost in just 18 months. Come to find out there was actually an earthquake 
in Kentucky, I believe it was in 1812, and that was something that none of these people had experienced before. They did not have an educational frame of reference for understanding what an earthquake was, why it happened, what it meant. So it totally freaked them out. Um, they were convinced that they, were, they weren't going to be able to plant. Their crops were going to fail. They were going to not be able to survive in that place. And so the entire community, which was mostly family, um, just picked up and moved. So when I discovered about the earthquake and then had read up about the fact that this was some of the attitudes and information that people believed because this earthquake occurred, um, I was able to piece together that, that information or that story. So those are just a couple of examples of ways in which you can understand if you ask this question, why people immigrated or migrated. Did they own property or not? Um, even something as simple as understanding about moving day in big cities. If your family lived in a big city, um, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, um, moving day was May 1st. And moving day meant that um, new property, like property owners would give you a break on rent if you moved into their property. And so rather than staying in your apartment year after year after year after year paying rent, everybody would move because they'd get a little bit of a rent break for moving into a new property. Um, that is one of the reasons or one of the ways in which that, that happens. And so uh, even understanding something as simple as did they own property or did they rent property? If they rented property, what did that mean? Um, you know, did the person who owned the property sell the property? If they owned property, um, did they own that property outright? Or do they share that property or share ownership of that property with other family members? And maybe some of the reasons why um, things change in their lives is because somebody passes away or somebody decides they want to sell their share of the property or the person who owns the property that they are living on decides to sell, or you know, lots of different events, again, that occur locally that will affect some of the choices that those people make. Uh, did they, did your, your ancestor or any of their family members serve in the military? Again, that's going to very often shape um, perceptions, uh, opinions, choices that that family makes. And so remember, we're not just researching the parents and the parents and the parents and the parents. Always pay attention to the children and the grandchildren and the siblings and the nieces and nephews in any given family. Because again, a lot of those, um, those family dynamics and those family decisions and the events that occur to members of the family affect the larger family, uh, the, uh, the larger family. And then um, this kind of goes back to my earthquake story, but um, what was the weather like? You know, were there any major natural occurrences? For example, um, in New England, in the early 1800s, there were um, several years there where the where there was no rainfall, like very minimal rainfall. And so growing crops became a real struggle for some of these farmers. And so they moved year after year trying to find a place that was going to allow them to support their families. And so you see several migrations of, of people, especially farmers, during that time period throughout um, the New England states trying to find a place where they can, uh, can grow some crops. So uh, what were, what was the weather like? You know, was there a volcano that went off somewhere else in the world that affected weather patterns um, in the colonial states? Was there, you know, I mean, like lots of different questions like that. So those are just a few examples of some of the questions that I've used very specifically in my own research. And there are others, of course, but then the question becomes, how can you find the answers to those questions? So I'm just going to give um, give you a couple of examples or some some places to look. <clears throat> the first thing, of course, is to extract all the information from the records you already have in your possession. I mentioned earlier census records. Those census records have questions on them beyond what this person's name, age, and birth date or birthplace is. 
And so pay attention to all the little tick marks, right? We've got tick marks about education. We've got tick marks on the census about can they read and write. We have information not just about their occupation, but starting <clears throat> in the earlier censuses, we have information about how much their real estate is worth, how much their personal property is worth. As we get into later censuses, uh, there are notations about whether or not they own or rent their home. And if they own their home, if they still have a mortgage on it, or if they have already paid that mortgage off, all of that information is found on census records. Let me just give you, uh, let me just give you a quick look at one of the places where you can go to make sure you understand what those census records mean. Uh, under the Learning Center, if you come to First Steps, <clears throat> you're going to find a whole bunch of resources, but just a couple on this page that are going to be really specifically uh, helpful for you. One is this link right here to start with paper and pencil. And in here, you can download blank copies, uh, blank copies of the U.S. Census Forms, U.K. Census Forms, or the Canadian Census Forms. What that's going to allow you to do is actually see the column headers more clearly so that you know or can, can learn more about exactly what questions were asked on a specific census. So here, for example, we have the 1870 census. You can read through the census headers here to see. It's not just about the name and the age and the gender and the, the race of the person. There's occupational information real estate and personal property value. Um, there is information about parentage, whether their parents were foreign born or US born. Um, over here we have information about education. Did they attend school? Can they read and write? Is this person deaf, dumb, blind, insane, idiotic, pauper, or convict? Right, a whole list of um, potential things there that could affect them and could affect your research. So all of these little tick marks, all of these little columns on the census mean something. Uh, so be sure to come here and, and download a blank census form if you're not sure what those column headings are, because you can read them a little better on those blank forms, and then pay attention to that entire record. Also here there is um, a, some help articles that you can access that will give you more information about the census if you're just getting started with that. So be sure to extract all information from the records. And that means not just the census records, but look at every piece of information on a passenger list or a naturalization document, every piece of information that you can find on a birth certificate or a death certificate. Extract all the information. Now when I ext say extract it, what I mean is write it down somewhere. You're not going to remember that information, let's be honest. Um, I very rarely remember everything about any particular person in my family tree. But what I do is I create notes. I write notes about the people in my tree as I discover things about them and about the time period that they lived and the people that they were associated with and the jobs that they did. And as I, as I extract that information from those records, I create notes. Now I do mine in family tree maker, but I sync my family tree maker with my ancestry tree. And so here you can see, I have this ability to view, um, or you could add or, uh, add a note depending on whether or not you have that information. And so here are my notes about this particular great grandfather. And you can see I've extracted the information from every record because it helps me have better context or information about this person and his life. So write it down, it, record that information somewhere. For me, I choose to record that information directly into my family tree with the people that, that it affects. Use maps to understand the geography of the time and the place. Maps are probably a, one of the best historically contextual things, but they also give you information about historical events. One of my favorite map websites is called mapofus.org. Um, there are maps for Europe. There are maps for Canada. There are maps. So, so there are other, other um, mapping places that you can go to if you're doing research in other places. But for the uh, benefit of time here, we're just going to focus on the U.S. 
So this map of US, the reason I love this is because it provides uh, information about the formation of county boundaries, which again is something that affects my ancestors' lives. <clears throat> so here is uh, the state of North Carolina long before uh, there were states. Uh, here is North Carolina in 1664. And I can just quickly go through as year after year, counties are formed and you can see here just a few little counties up here in the top um, corner and then we start to expand we see some we start to see the expansion as n new property is uh, opened up new land is opened up for settlement as new counties are formed and so again this is this is a map but it's really about historical events or historical context as new counties are created, as new lands are opened up for settlement, that might explain why my family started out here and ended up over here, right? Because, and and as, and as it's time bound, right? So even though, again, that it's a map, it's also a timeline because I start to see when those events occurred, when those new counties were formed, when that new land was opened up. If I compare that, to a timeline of my own family's lives, for example, the birthplaces of the children in a family. Why were the first three children born in one county and the next two children born in another county and the final three children born in a third county, right? Well, if I work my way through this map and compare the dates to the dates of events in the lives of my family members, I might discover they never moved at all. I might discover they actually stayed in the same place, but new counties were created out of that location that they lived. Or I may discover that, well, the year that that third child was born in a different county, this new county was created way over here. So clearly they moved um, as new land was opened up. So maps are a great, quick, visual way to start to understand more, again, about the choices that your family members were making. And Map of US is my personal favorite, then you can just click on a specific state and work your way through this timeline of the development of that particular state, okay? Uh, let's talk about timelines in general. So we've looked at a map as a timeline, but there are a lot of timelines available. And you can just Google timeline for anything, right? Timeline for Kentucky, timeline of U.S. history, timeline of Germany, timeline for like Google timelines and anything and you're going to find some things. But let me just share with you a couple of um, my personal favorites uh, websites to use for this. One is history.com. Um, history.com has interactive timelines for different events in history. Uh, and we're talking, you know, back to the Roman Empire and, uh, you know, back to Genghis Khan and all the way up to, you know, current day to 9-11 and to the um, war in the Middle East. And, you know, okay, so they, they have lots of, they cover a lot of history. And so you can come in here and you can do a search on their website, history.com, for any particular event. And they will provide you with timelines and some interactive information about specific things that relate to that event. So this is a portion of their website that was created for the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And I can come in here and these are the five deadliest battles of the Civil War. And you can see, um, you know, it's kind of like a graph on a map of the number of deaths that occurred. And I can then click on any one of those things and give me additional information about that particular battle. So, you know, my family, I have a lot of family from, from around Chickamauga about that time. And so even though there's only two or three known family members who actually fought at the battle, one of them was wounded, um, the battle still affected my family because they lived in this area. And so understanding more about that was important to me. So I can come in here and I can click on this and learn more about that particular battle. 
lots of different ways you can use this history.com website. Again, you just type in a specific event or a specific time period and they'll return all of the resources they have on their website for that. Um, there's another uh, website I love just because this has, this is a very compacted view of history around the world. It's hyperhistory.com hyperhistory.com and you can see down the left hand column here it's all of the different um, regions of the world and then um, we've got uh, just a timeline and you can drill down on any one of these events and it will pop up a little um, reference about that so I can click on it and it will just tell me more about you know the reign of the Stuarts the rule of the Stuarts in uh, in England and, and Scotland. It'll tell me about the English Civil War in the 1600s, which actually is really important in my personal history because um, I have a lot of family who came to America because the Civil War um, was happening. That was why they chose to leave England. So look, you know, you can look at the French Revolution, see what was happening there, um, any one of these things. So you probably can't see this on your screen real clearly right now, but um, this gives a really good broad overview of the history of the world from 1400 to 2000, which is, a you know, 1400 is about the outside of when we're going to be getting any kind of records for our family history anyway. So most of the research we're going to be doing is within, um, you know, 15, 16, 17, 1800. So that, that's a good, a good chunk of time. And like I said, it covers the whole world, which I appreciate because it's just the singular glance of things going on around the world. The final website uh, that I use a lot for history timelines and for understanding more about just what's going on in the world and what's going on in, in the country is the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian Institute's uh, institutions website. So it's SI, Smithsonian Institution, si.edu is their website and they have a, a few different timelines and again kind of like the history website their timelines are links that you can click and as you click those links sometimes it will give you additional information um, about that particular event but even more important for me they give you a bibliography of books you can read to understand more about that particular event. So the Lewis and Clark Trail, that's something that I've been studying more about lately um, because of the opening up of the West and what that meant and, and how their work affected the work of some other people who came after them. And so I've been really fascinated with that lately. And so here is a whole list of books that I could go out and go to my local library and, and um, check out or that I could purchase and read more about this particular event and understand more about how that affected the lives of my ancestors. Things like the Trail of Tears, uh, the forced migration of the Cherokee Indians, um, the invention of the telegraph and how that affected the lives of people and the ways in which we communicate. Um, reconstruction after the Civil War. I mean, again, just any anything that might have affected your ancestors. The more you understand what's happening in the world, what's happening in the country and what's happening locally, the more likely you are to be able to piece together the information you have with your family history to draw some conclusions about why they made the choices that they made. So those are some of my favorite websites for um, getting that timeline information and for drilling down into some additional information. And then for local history, uh, there are local histories that have been written and newspapers. Newspapers are such a gold mine of information. And if you watched the Who Do You Think You Are episode last night, you know um, that the newspapers were relied on very heavily to understand more about this particular ancestor and the choices that he made and some of the consequences of some of those choices. So local histories and newspapers. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Ancestry.com card catalog, I would encourage you to get familiar with that. Come into search. Card catalog is the bottom option there. That's going to show you a list of all of the databases available on Ancestry.com. Just a couple that I'm going to recommend uh, for you. If you type in the word almanac, you'll see that Ancestry.com has about 28 almanacs from different places in the world, Ireland, Scotland, um, 
different uh, places in the U.S., you know, Idaho, um, Ontario, Canada, I mean, just different places and time periods. So we do have some of these online. You can also Google uh, for some almanacs that Google Books has digitized and placed online. But almanacs help you understand weather patterns and help you understand uh, information about um, about what was happening in the environment uh, that your ancestor lived in a particular year. So those almanacs provide you with some great, again, historical context and information about some events. Also local histories. So I'll just use Ashland as an example. My family's from Ashland, Ohio, um, one of the branches of my family. And so I can type in the name of a county and you can do this with any county in the U.S. or in um, uh, re locations in Canada or England or Germany. And we have these published books that have been written about those locations. And so I can come in here. Here is a history of North Central Ohio. This book was published in 1931. I could just search this book for my ancestor, which is what a lot of times we get stuck in the habit of doing. Oh, I found a book. I'm going to check the index and see if my ancestor is mentioned. The problem with that is you lose all the historical context. Over here, you're going to see a table of contents. And many of these old books that we've digitized, we've placed these tables of contents online so that you can see exactly what's in here. In this case, there's a historical index, kind of a timeline of the events going on in that location around that time, or, you know, during the time from when it was first founded up through 1931. There's a biographical index, so it's a listing of prominent people in the community. Again, understanding the community will help you understand more about your ancestor. Uh, there's a whole chapter on the location and the area and the influence and the geology. What If your ancestors were farmers, the dirt is important. Okay, Understanding what could grow and what couldn't grow. Uh, oftentimes our ancestors migrated to a, from a place to a place that had similar soil because they knew how to grow things in that environment. And so if you understand more about the dirt, then you can look to see where else in the world has similar dirt. And now you have an idea of where they may have migrated from. So something as simple as that. I could go on, but we're so out of time. I wish I could keep talking about this, but read those tables of contents. Um, and then you can just click on the link there. It will take you to the first page in that book. And I can zoom out a little bit here. And then using these little page arrows down here, I could just go page by page through that book, um, reading it just like I would any other book. So be willing to explore local histories and newspapers and use the card catalog on Ancestry.com to discover some of those little known gems that you may not have uncovered before. Okay. Um... Let's just let me just wrap up with just a couple of informations, a couple pieces of information about how you can record this information. Great researchers write. I use my notes um, in on the person if it's people specific. Um, I write blog posts. I write um, you know I write journal entries. I keep a notebook. I I write all the time. And so I would encourage you to get in the habit of starting to write. If you want to start a blog, if you um, want to just write stories or letters to your family members, those are a great way to practice writing out that information because writing it also helps you assimilate the information and make sure that you have it correct in your mind, and then you can make um, better decisions about where to research next and, and what comes next. So, uh, like I said, we're over time, and there's so much more I could tell you about this topic. Uh, hopefully, though, you've been inspired to go out and do some digging on your own. Use the card catalog, use Google, use some of those websites that I've discussed, and just go explore the history of the time and the place where one of your ancestors may have lived. Just pick one and, and dive in and see what you can discover. That's all I have for you today. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the journey into history. And until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.